All right, I'll ask you to open your Bibles to the book of Malachi. It's pretty easy to find because it's the very last uh, book in the Old Testament. So if you uh, have your Bibles and turn to the, the very last book of the Old Testament, I have entitled this particular series, Malachi, God's Love Answers Man's Lethargy. Um, and so that's kind of the official title, if you will, of the series. And so it fits in the bulletin. And it's they kind of alliterated a little bit, love, lethargy. And yet my unofficial title that I have written down that won't fit in the bulletin, that's not alliterated, is Malachi, God's final message to a religious, self-deceived, forgetful, self-centered, rebellious people with a sense of superiority and entitlement, i.e. the professing church today. So that doesn't fit in the bulletin. So I just decided to go with God's love answers man's lethargy. Um, so you'll see that each week in the bulletin as we go through. But really, I, I, and we're, we're going to get to this and talk about this. Malachi is really, as we're going to see, God's final message to a religious, self-deceived, forgetful, and self-centered, rebellious people with a sense of superiority and entitlement. And it's fascinating to me because this sounds a lot like the church today. Now, this is not written to the church. This was written to the people of Israel, as we're going we're to talk about that and see. But of course, we know from the New Testament, the Apostle Paul makes this clear through inspiration of the Holy Spirit in several places, that while all Scripture is not written to us, it's all written for us. And it is practical and applicable. All Scripture is practical and applicable for us today as we seek to apply what it uh, means and so that's what we're going to do. Now, last week I gave everyone an assignment, and I said, read through the book of Malachi. There's only four chapters. It's not that long. Uh, it's not that difficult. It's not hard reading. It's not long. It's not too bad. So those of you, and I mentioned this last, well, I mentioned it Sunday night, and I think I mentioned, and I mentioned it Wednesday night. So those of you who were here on Sunday night worshiping with us, those who are here on Wednesday night worshiping with us will have gotten the assignment if you have read it through, then you can, I, would, I ask you to help me out here and participate in kind of our introductory consideration of Malachi. If you haven't read it, don't try to participate, okay, in this particular section here for maybe the next couple of minutes. So that happens sometimes, you know, we want to be involved, but we haven't done the homework, you know, and so we have something to say, but it doesn't really work. So if you've read it, if you've done your homework, I have a couple questions for you. And I want to do that by way of introducing our study. Number one, um, how, those of you who have read it, how would you describe the tone of this prophecy? There's no right or wrong answers. I'm curious for those who read through the book how you would describe the tone of the prophecy or how you would describe the tone of the book of Malachi. You know, there's different tones of different books in Scripture. Some are very comforting. Some are very, uh, har some are harsh. Some are you know, kind of a little bit of a mix, some are, um, yeah, you know, di different tone. You, everybody knows the idea of kind of a tone. What's the tone? Let's see. We'll start with you, Ruth. I have a feeling that in modern-day vernacular, the word fed up is used. Back off with what you've done. Okay, good. That's a good tone. I mean, how many times have you uh, or your parents said something to you and you could tell, even though they didn't say, I'm fed up with you, you could tell from the tone that like they were fed up with you, you know, and your behavior. Uh, that that is a tone. Very good. I appreciate that. What else? Any other reflections, Pastor Gary? Blunt and very pointed. Good. Okay. It, it's it's a tone of being, you know, tired of this, and yet it's it's very pointed and blunt. There's no holding back. Good. Thank you very much, Cheryl. Good. Yeah. Good, a tone. That, that's, a, that's another excellent tone. Uh, we have kind of fed up and tired and blunt and disappointed, Chuck. I find it interesting that he used the, the parent-child because that's kind of how I look at it. You could still say something and then they're responsive to me. Yeah, great. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's, it is, a, it is a, a, what we could call it, like a, a familial tone, a family tone, like a father with his kids children, um, which is what we have, the analogy you have here. So excellent, excellent. What else? Anybody else have any insights on the tone? John? Well, 
Yeah. No, exa- excellent. That, you know, r- um, disappointment because of a lack of respect, if you will, uh, toward him. Anything else? I don't want to shut anybody out that has taken the time to read it. Yes, Roy. Good. Excellent. And we're going to, they're going to get to that. We're going to talk about that today. It sounds pretty negative. All these things we're talking about because it is, it is disappointment and harsh and, you know, kind of tired and fed up. And yet this is what's exciting about this book. And that's why I'm excited about it. It's not discouraging and depressing at all. I mean, it is, but it's not. (laughs) And uh, we're going to talk about that. And so very, very, very important to see that. And I appreciate you bringing that out. That's why I like to do this because people can, we can see different things and build on that. Okay, next question. Now, this is just something that, you know, as I remember reading this years ago as a, as a younger person, there are certain things that really stood out to me. Um, and it can, you know, there's no right or wrong answer. There's no concrete. What stood out to you most after reading this book or this prophecy? I mean, a particular Way, the way something was said, a particular verse. Uh, did something just really kind of stand out and pop out? I'll share with you what, what mine was eventually, but how about yourself? Cheryl? Well, I love the first three, uh, verse 2, when they that feared the Lord came often once together, and the Lord hearkened and heard it, 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 and the Lord I'll talk about this a little bit more later, but when I was growing up, my grandfather preached a message and you know about that, about the book of remembrance. And I always remember that. It's one of those things that stood out to me when I was young and I, he, he preached this message and um, I never, ever forgot it. I mean, I don't remember much of the rest of the book and the rest of Malachi, but I remember that message and his emphasis on that, that book of remembrance. And of course, we'll get there and we'll talk about that. But that's what stood out to me from this entire book prophecy letter or however you want to say it. Um, but great. Anybody else have, and you could be the same thing, but you can, something that stood out. Mom. I literally uh, was blessed with ch- chapter three, verse six, where it says, for I am the Lord, they change not. That's, uh, we're going to talk a lot about that even today. So <clears throat> can I share with what Mari shared with me last night? Mari shared with me last night and was saying, that verse was the first verse she ever memorized when she was in kindergarten. So she remembers that from memorizing that, and when she was in kindergarten, is that particular verse, Malachi uh, chapter 3 and verse 6. That is going to be a very important um, theme, if you will, throughout this book. One of the two big themes, if you will, or main underlying grids through which we have to look at this prophecy is the immutability. <clears throat> but I'll get there. I don't want to get ahead of myself. Anything else that really stood out to you after you read it? <clears throat> John. There's no right or wrong. (laughs) Excellent. Another very important aspect of this book is the prophetic aspect of, um, well, I'm not going to get too far ahead of myself, but the Messiah who will come and even farther beyond that, things that haven't happened yet. When he will come the second time, so we'll get there. But excellent, yeah, there's, there's a groundwork being laid, and I'm going to say this right now, too, without trying to give away too much right off the bat. There's a groundwork that's being laid in the sense that this is it. This is God's last message. For four to five hundred years, he will not in any way speak to his people again through prophets, through any kind of other way. This is it. So he's, this is... This is it. He's laying this groundwork for something to come. I don't know. We'll have to talk to him about that. I have to, we'll have to ask him about this. You can look at what? First and second Maccabees and, you know, so we'll talk about that. <laughs> Wrong church, Chuck. Sorry. No, that's great. Okay. Third question. Unless anybody, anybody else, anything that stood out? Okay, third question. What do you, it kind of ties in this third question because you've already kind of dealt with this. What do you believe is God's underlying message in this prophecy? 
you've, you've already kind of touched on it. What, what, after you taking the time to read the four chapters, you walk away, what do you walk away thinking concerning, here's what God is telling his people. What is the underlying message as you see it from reading <clears throat> Ruth? Good. That's great. That's great. That ties in very well with what Roy and Cindy noticed from this. You know, a lot of the, the negative, but also there's the hope. And that's that's great. Oh, yeah. Oh, chapter four. Oh, all, the whole thing. Wow. You know, yes. Very good. Anybody else? Yes, Lynn. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Great. Absolutely. And and this is the again, there's this underlying I don't, you know, I don't know the, there's this thread of that that underlies this entire book. Like, you know, God's calling them to something. He's given them the ability and the tools, and we'll talk about that. Uh, so good. Absolutely very helpful. Anything else before we move on? Kind of take, like, yeah, I'm, I'm going to start talking fast, Samuel. Okay, so no. <laughs> good. No, I appreciate it. I want to give you the historical context this morning of this book, the moral context. Again, this is an introduction to the book. We're going to look at the author, the literary approach. We're going to summarize some things and then come up with some theological implications and some key practical lessons. We're going to do all that with the time that we have here. First, I want to talk about the historical context. This is very, very important. It, it, it really is, is I, it, I can't go without saying the importance of understanding the historical context when you're reading a book of the Bible. Um, here's where Malachi takes place. The people had returned to their land from the Babylonian captivity in three different phases. Okay? Now, remember the Babylonian captivity. We all know this. Uh, Daniel, and this, you all know the, the stories of Daniel. Well, Daniel and his, the, the people of Israel or Jerusalem was ransacked by Nebuchadnezzar and came and took away the, the, the people and all, you know, all that stuff. So the, 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 what we call the Babylonian captivity lasted for how long? Remember how long that lasted? 70 years. According to Jeremiah prophesied it was going to be 70 years. And sure enough, it was 70 years. And so um, it lasted for 70 years. At the end of the 70 years, the kings begin to allow the people of Israel, the Israelites, to, to go back to their homeland, which again was ransacked and destroyed. And so they begin to return in three different phases. First of all, the original handful of Jews were led by Zerubbabel, 535 years before Christ, fulfilling Jeremiah's prophecy that the captivity would last 70 years. During that time, they begin to rebuild the temple. Okay, so this first group of Babylonian captives and you know the people were displaced, were heading back to Israel. They be under a leader by the name of governor, by the name of Zerubbabel, and they begin to rebuild uh, the temple. There were two prophets that ministered during this time, that is Haggai and Zechariah. Okay, so, you know, they're giving the people God's word during this time of restoration to their land, if you will, moving back to their land. A second group was led later by Ezra, Ezra the scribe. Um, he led some people back, and he intended to get the people back to a right relationship with God, to their understanding of his word. He emphasized and was trying to focus on teaching them how, what the word had to say, what God's word had to say concerning worship and the temple and, you know, all these things. Um, the temple was built. Now the people needed to worship according to God's standards. So thus Ezra comes on the scene, takes, leads some people back. And that, that's what happens there. Then the third group was led by, you know, one of my favorites, Nehemiah, 
Remember that, Nehemiah, his purpose was to rebuild the wall around Jerusalem and fortify the city. I mean, his heart was heavy because there were some people that were, you know, traveling and returning to, to where he was saying, you know, man, the city's, the wall's in shambles. The people are just, you know, not where they need to be. And Nehemiah's heart was burdened. And so the king let him go lead a group back to rebuild and fortify the walls of the city. It's possible that Malachi delivered these words during the time Nehemiah was back in Judah, very likely during the time of Nehemiah or shortly right there about. So keep in mind, um, the people were back in their land, the temple was up, and the city of Jerusalem was fortified. This is when, this is when Malachi comes on the scene, okay? They're back in the land. I mean, you know, their third group of people have already come back. The temple's up. Nehemiah was, had either fortified the city through the rebuilding of the wall or it was in the process or almost done, okay? And this is the context of, of Malachi. The moral context. I, I didn't give you guys any handouts today because I thought, well, I mean, I don't know how much you just like writing stuff down or just kind of we'll, we'll consider this. And I thought we'll just consider this without having to write things down. The moral context is we're going to see from the book that people were living lives of moral and spiritual laxity while still going through the motions of worshiping God. So they're back in their land. There's the temple. There's the walls. But yet, oh, they're doing what they were supposed to do, quote unquote. You know, they were going through these motions of outward ritual worship, if you will, to God. And yet their hearts were so far from him. And so that's a major moral context of this book. They returned to their homeland, but they had not returned to the Lord. You know, the influences of the Babylonians and the influences of the Medo-Persians were, you know, seeping into their culture and they go back and they don't even know. Remember, Ezra had to go back to even kind of teach them how, what God had to say about worship and acceptable worship. So they're kind of going through some motions, but the influences of the pagan nations around them were great. They were intermarrying with pagan Gentiles, which was forbidden by the Lord. They were divorcing their own wives and husbands. I mean, you know, just the, the moral context was on a scale of one to 10, we're looking at, you know, a one or a two. It was a very bad, a very bad moral situation in which uh, Malachi comes on the scene. Well, Here's the author, Malachi. Uh, very little is known of him except his name means my messenger. Uh, we look in ver verse 1 of chapter 1, the burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. These weren't Malachi's words to the people. These were God's words to his people during this time through Malachi. God's very words. It's the, not the, notice in verse 1, it's not the burden of Malachi. It's the burden of that burden, it's this, this, and I love that word because it, it means something that's being delivered, but it's the very use of the word burden carries the idea of, I mean, it's, something's heavy here, you know? There's a heavy message that needs to be declared, not light. Every time that in the Old Testament, I believe that, it, that, that a prophecy and the word burden is used interchangeably, it's not some light, hey, you guys are, you know, you guys are doing good. I mean, it's a burden. It's a weight, a burden of the word of the Lord to Israel by Malachi. Malachi. God gave Malachi a message, as we're going to see, of both confrontation and hope. Both confrontation and hope. Confrontation because the Israelites needed to be called out for their sin, you know? And of course, only God could do this. I got to thinking about this as I was preparing. Only God could do this. Why? Well, besides the fact that he's God, but why else? Because they're going through the motions on the outside, but he, he's the only one who really knows the inside. God, God knew the heart. He knows the heart, just like every single one of us in here today. I'm thankful you're here. You should be here this morning, you know, whether you like it or not. Uh, but just the fact of you being here doesn't mean you have any proper fellowship with God right now in your life. <laughs> only God knows the heart. And so here, Malachi confronts these people and calling them out for their sin, something only God could do because it's the burden of the word of the Lord. Now, at the same time, hope, hope because God ultimately desires fellowship with his own. You know, he's not a God to, you know, chastise and discipline just for the sake because he likes chastisement and discipline. On the contrary, I mean, he wants fellowship. And we're going to see and we're going to talk about this. 
The task of a prophet isn't to smooth things over with the people, but to faithfully declare the word of God. And this is what we find Malachi doing to this group that was back in the land after years of captivity, and yet they're going through some motions, yet they're completely apathetic and they're completely lethargic. We're going to take the time to see that. The literary approach of Malachi is fascinating, and those of you who read it this week probably really noticed this and caught on to this literary approach, which is fascinating. It's not simply just Malachi you know, declaring words. It's, it's a series of God's assertions. Here's what God is saying, followed by the people's rhetorical response, which is just neat. It's really fascinating to, to read that and, and to study. Um, Malachi uses what's called a, and this is a big word, but you know, in the, con, in the genre, it's a rhetorical disputation speech form, if you will, uh, which contains four components. Assertion, questioning, response, and implication. And we see that throughout. In fact, throughout this book, we find six disputations throughout this book, six different ones. An assertion God makes, a question, and then a response and an implication. An assertion God makes. God makes this assertion, and then the people respond in a question. And it's always, as my, my dad said when he used to preach to Malachi, who, me? You know, that was the title of his messages in his series was always, who, me? So, and of course, he'd always use me an example when I was a little kid. And I'd run around, I'd get a look at my face after I got in trouble and say, what, me? You know, I know, he, he used to all the time, okay. And then, then, um, then a response, then God's response to their question, and then an implication of that. Here's the implication of my assertion and your questioning. So that's the literary approach, if you will. So I, we summarize the entire book by way of introducing it this morning in this way. Malachi charged God's people, God charged his people, but through Malachi, with seven specific sins, seven specific sins. And I want you, when we read through these sins and we go through, I want you to consider how they're the very real sins that exist in the professing church today as well. Okay, well, all, all of these. We're going to talk about this and we're going to look, up, look these up. Number one, the first, the first sin that God specifically charged his people with through the word of Malachi, number one, denying to love God and see his love for them. In chapter one and verse two, I have loved you, saith the Lord, yet ye say, wherein hast thou loved us? That's the first charge right there. Failure, denial to love God and to see his love for them. Second charge is found in, in chapter 1 and verse 6, where we read, A son honoreth his father, and a servant his master. If then I be a father, where is my honor? If I be a master, where is my fear? Saith the Lord of hosts unto you, O priests, that despise my name. And ye say, wherein have we despised thy name? So the second sin is a lack of fear of God and honor to him. Lack of fear of God and honor to him. Now, like I said, keep in mind, these are sins. These are God is asserting, he's charging his people with these things, and I want you to think about the fact of how real this is today. A lack, denying to really love God and see his love for them. Number two, a lack of fear of God and a lack of honor to him. Third thing, the third sin, chapter 2 and verse 14. Notice chapter 2 and verse 14. Divorce and intermarriage with pagan women. Chapter 2 and verse 14. Yet ye say, wherefore, because the Lord hath been witness between thee and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously. Yet is she thy companion and the wife of thy covenant. We'll talk about this. Divorce. And intermarriage with women that God clearly declared. You, you shouldn't have anything to do with them. You should not be uniting with them in a marriage relationship. That's a third sin. I just, I lump it together, divorce and intermarriage with pagan women. Number three, the third, or I mean, number four, the fourth, perverting the words and judgments of God, perverting God's words and perverting God's judgment. Look at chapter two and verse 17. Ye have wearied the Lord with your words. Remember just a couple of uh, months ago, we looked at um, one of the major prophets and we looked at Isaiah and Jeremiah and God saying, I am tired of you. You're tired of me. And I'm tired of you. And, and we looked at that. And yet here in Malachi, we see 
God saying through Malachi, ye have wearied the Lord with your words, yet ye say, wherein have we wearied him? And, and, and here, here is this, here's a case in point. When ye say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them, or where is the God of judgment? I mean, again, I mean, does this not sound like today we pervert the truth and we call evil good and good evil? And God is charging his people here with perverting the words of God and the judgment of God. Look at the very last phrase. Where is the God of judgment? You know, I mean, we, we, we're going to set our own standards for righteousness and morality and, and, you know, evil is good and good is evil. And we see that tone all throughout the Old and the New Testament. I'm not talking about the unbelieving world. We're God's people calling good evil and evil good. Getting to the point, they're getting to the point over time when they're so influenced by the culture and they're so focused on self that they turn that which is truth and right and good into something that's totally perverse, and they say, well, this is what God likes. God's, God's good with this. It's all fine. Well, that's the fourth sin, perverting the words and judgments of God. Number five, disobedience to the ordinance of, as of God. Chapter three and verse seven. Look at this. Even from the days of your fathers, you're gone away from my ordinances, and I've not kept them. You know, God made it very clear to his people. Here is my will for you and what I desire of you. And it just didn't mean anything to them. You know, we got our own thing going. Disobedience, the ordinances of God. Number six, the sixth sin is found in the very next verse in verse eight. Theft, robbing God of that which was due him. Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me, God says. You know, it's kind of this neat paradoxical thing. Well, you can't really rob God, but God says, hey, you've robbed me, okay? That, there's a lesson for us in that. And we'll talk about that when we get there. Ro theft, robbing God of that which was due him. Again, we're comparing these things to the church today or the professing church today. W what kind of emphasis is placed on God's people to give to him today? And when there is emphasis, what kind of people or who actually gives to the Lord? That's exactly, I said this Sunday night. I said it two Sunday nights ago, I think. People don't give unless they want something in return. Well, that's not giving. That's not giving to the Lord when we want something in return for it. And we, we you know, I, 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 I talked about that a little bit when we were, we were dealing with some things on Sunday night. And um, yeah, that's, I mean, talk about robbing God. God is saying, these people have robbed me. And then the seventh sin, unbelief. Chapter three and verse 13. Look at chapter three and verse 13. Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord, yet ye say, what have we spoken so much against thee? I mean, you know, and in the context here, I don't have time to do it. Of course, this is an introduction. We'll get there. They're claiming that worshiping and obeying God is vain. We're going through, have you heard this even? Okay, let me, let me put this to the church today. Have you heard that, you know, I'm going to go to church. I'm going through the motions, but I don't have to be there. It doesn't help me anyway. It's not that important for me to be in church. Same with the giving to God. It's not that important for me to give to God. You know, it's all, it's kind of, it's all vain. I'm, I'm saved. I have my own relationship with God. That's all that matters. You know, I mean, you know, we can go into this. This is what God is charging his people with, with this horrific attitude that, that they were having toward him. And yet it's all couched in piety. It's all couched in piety. Oh, we're okay. We're doing good. We're giving to the Lord. We're going through the motions. You know, if I could put it in today's you know, terms. We're in church. You know, I'm being a good person. Yes, Lynn. I had my hair trimmed yesterday and your haircut looks like it looks really nice. It looks great. Yeah, I was talking to her. She actually opened up the conversation like it's really cool. But she opened up the Mm-hmm. I just read this week, I read it, was it to you or Gary? One either Mario or Gary. We're, we're, the Pope is telling us to make sure to be praying to our guardian angel. So keep, keep praying to your guardian angels because of the emphasis they have. Anyway, I'm just saying that's, that's you know, that's the attitude, okay? It's the attitude that the, the religious unbelieving world has out there, but sadly it's the attitude a lot of even professing Christians and Bible-believing churches have today, you know? It's not real to me. I'm just going through it. And I don't really need to go through it. It's all kind of vain anyway, because I have my own line to God and relationship with him. The church isn't that important. 
giving's not that important. I've heard these things. I've heard them. It's sad, but I've heard it. Well, someone put it this way to summarize it. Um, in each case, God's contemporaries, I mean, Malachi's contemporaries, responded by challenging his criticism. They said, how have we done that? Their response indicated hardness of heart, a resistance to deal with the internal conditions in their hearts that needed correcting. Malachi revealed the sensitivity of God to their condition and the insensitivity of the people to it. They believed that since they were serving God as he directed, he must be pleased with them. Malachi said that their hearts were not right with God and he was not pleased with them. The people had a form of godliness, but they were devoid of the power of godliness. I mean, that's a good kind of summarization of this book. Okay, uh, four things of theological significance or theological implications and then some, some key practical things. Um, four, four, four things that I want to consider with this book that are theologically significant or there's theological implications of this book. Number one is this, God's love, justice, character, and judgments do not change. Okay, this is, like I said, very important. Someone, you guys brought this up earlier. He is immutable. This book really brings that out. The immutability of God, the unchangeableness of God. See, the, um, and next week we'll talk about one aspect of this, the love of God. But, but he's immutable. The problem seeds with mankind, with us, who not only change our outward behavior, but we can even change our inward character as well. We're the problem, not God. He doesn't change, we do. I am the Lord, I change not. I mean, it's in this, in this book, chapter three and verse six. God's character never changes. His promises never fail and his word stands forever. And that is exactly the point that God is making to his people throughout this book. I believe this attribute, if you will, of God, of immutability, of changing not, his character never changing, his promises, his word never changing, is an important grid through which to observe the whole book. So as you read through Malachi and you take the time to study it, understand that, see that, see that this is what God, this is who God is and what he is declaring to his people, his immutability, okay? And, and you'll see what I mean as we go through it. Um, but, but think about that as you read through Malachi, the immutability of God. That's the first uh, thing of uh, theological significance that, I, that we, we, this stands out from the book. Number two, love is a vital aspect of the character of God. And this really seems to be the center of God's interaction with his people is his love. So we have the, the, the attribute or the character of God's immutability and love. We, we see this, and like I said, next week, Lord willing, we'll talk about this in more detail in the first few verses. This love is not based upon their love for him or their faithfulness to him, but upon his sovereign choice. He loves them. And we're going to talk about that, and we'll get there next week in this fascinating verse. You know, I, I was surprised nobody said when I was asking what really stood out to you was the, you know, I love Jacob, I hate Esau. I mean, that stood out to me too. That's probably the number two thing after the book of remembrance. Like, wow. Okay, we'll talk about that and we'll get there. But God's love is a vital aspect of his character. And it, it seems, it, it, it's really the motivation or the, the center of his interaction with his people. And we see it throughout, through all four chapters. We'll talk about it. The third theological significance is that God, we're gonna see that God hates divorce and he hates union with those who reject him. We'll talk about that a little bit. Um, marriage is a binding covenant between one man and woman that is more than simply a physical union. It is a spiritual union as well. A spiritual union. Um, and we'll talk more about that again. But, but this is a major theological significance in this book. Part of God's displeasure with his people is they're just divorcing of their own. I mean, you know, you're divorcing your 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 Hebrew wife, and then the intermarriage of those who are pagan. Married, you know, with what we would say today, unbelievers, those who, you know, don't know the Lord. I mean, it's, it's a serious thing in the eyes of God. And then, of course, the fourth uh, theological significance or implication 
is that although it might not seem like it now, as we see throughout this book, God does distinguish between the righteous and the wicked. And in the end, he will deal with such accordingly. It might not seem like it now. He's a God of justice, though. And we can look at chapter 3 and, and verses 5 and 6 and chapter 4 and the first three verses that, you know, he, his word does distinguish between right and wrong, the righteous, the wicked, and he will judge accordingly in the end. He will. Okay. Key practical lessons. Um, I'm just going to have to read what I have here because I'm out of time, running out of time. So I can't elaborate too much on these. But although God's people, number one, this is what it, we walk away from practically speaking throughout this book as a whole. Although God's people had failed him time and again, his prophetic plan would still come to pass. Okay. God's covenants with Abraham and David and all of that, they didn't depend on the faithfulness of Israel. Those covenants didn't depend on the, on the faithfulness of Israel. And today we can be sure that God's kingdom as described throughout the Old Testament will come to pass just as he said. Um, we also learn that even though we fail God constantly, our relationship with him and the promises of eternal life are sure and certain. See, what I want to do is take the truth that we find here with the interaction between God and his people in this time here in Malachi and apply it again, practically by way of application to our, to our situation and our context in which we find ourselves today. And that's one of the things, you know, you know, God's promises would come to pass regardless of the faithfulness of his people. And it's so true for us today as well. I mean, how many times have you, don't raise your hand, how many times have you failed God just this past week? <laughs> okay, just this past week, you failed him. I mean, you failed to put him first. You failed to love him, to communicate with him, to have him communicate. I mean, you know, you were just, in our interaction, God says, you know, you're one of mine. Nothing can change that. You, you know, we could be unfaithful to him. I don't want to be, but it can happen. It does happen. And yet God's words, his promises will come to pass. That's a, that's a very important practical lesson we're going to see throughout this book. Number two, honor and worship of God don't come about through hypocrisy or inward apathy or rebellion. I mean, that's a very important thing we're going to see here, practically speaking. It's not only impossible to worship God with a heart of apathy or rebellion, it's a grave offense to do so. Um... While we may at times simply go through the motions, God wants us to listen to him and repent of this sin and begin to walk in a path of obedience and fellowship with him. That's what he wants. I've heard people say before, well, my heart isn't right with God. I shouldn't even be in church anyway. I'm just not going to go because I'm not where I need to be spiritually. Like, no, the answer for that is for you to get your heart right. <laughs> okay, that's the answer. Not just to stay in this, you know, horrible spiritual condition, but to get your heart right and get back under the teaching of God's word and fellowship with God's people. That's the answer. Um, God wants us to listen to him. We're seriously deceived if we think God doesn't care about our lethargy or if we think we can continue going through the motions and still expect God's hand of blessing on our lives. We're, we're just deceiving ourselves. To the contrary, we can only expect his disciplining hand of chastisement. Of course, we can look at Hebrews chapter 12. So that's a very important practical truth. Number three, Despite God's abundant goodness, the heart of his own people will reflect an attitude of rebellion, entitlement, and forgetfulness, and that all results from a lack of love for God. Um, when true love departs, callous apathy sets in. And we can all think about the New Testament and maybe the church at Ephesus and different things, but that's true. I mean, that's so true. I mean, despite God's goodness, you know, the minute we lose our love for God and who he is, then, you know, callousness starts in in our lives. This is what we see with his people in the Old Testament. Number four, after this message, after Malachi, God's people would not hear from him again for over 400 years. Um, I'm sure a lot of them within that time thought, you see, you haven't heard from him from 200 years. I mean, it's, you know, none of that stuff is true. It's all legendary and great stuff. And 300 years goes by. See, hasn't heard from him in 300, 400. See, haven't heard from God in 400. I mean, you know, he said everything he wanted to say and needed to say. And I think this final message is one of both hope and rebuke, as we've said. It's very similar to our situation today. God has given us everything he wants us to know and nothing more needs to be revealed right now. Okay, so there's no new messages from God and tongues and prophecies and revelations. He's already said it. It's all here. This is everything he wants us to know right now. He's warned us of the dangers of apathy and lethargy in the Christian life, just like he did back in Malachi's day. 
And he's made it clear he will still intervene in the affairs of men yet future. <laughs> hmm. He will return to earth to establish his kingdom, and we will face the judgment seat of Christ. Those of us who know Christ as our Savior. Yet it's been about 2,000 years. A great length of time doesn't negate the reality of God's promises. And yet this is our problem. It's like, yeah, it's been so long. Is that all? I mean, I don't even know. Everybody says this isn't even true. Everybody says, well, I'm sure back, back then, 2,200 years ago, people thought, man, I haven't heard from God in 200 years. I wonder if any of that's even true. And yet as we're going to see, something happened. Somebody came along by the name of John the Baptist, which was prophesied here in Malachi, and the Messiah comes, which is probably, and wow, it's, just, it's the same today. This, the little book of Malachi in the Old Testament is a little version of this whole thing right here for us. I mean, this is it. We've got it all here, and it's been 2,000 years, but that doesn't mean it's not true or God's not going to finish what he's promised. Fascinating. Okay, number five. Here's the fifth thing. In all the times of apostasy, a remnant of faithful believers has always existed. And we see that in here, this remnant of faithful believers. These are those who truly love and fear the Lord and whose hearts are right with him. The same has been true, true through all the ages of the church. Now, I believe it's pointless to try to invent some kind of line of succession as independent, so a lot of Baptists do, Catholics do. There's, we're not going to find some line of succession going back to faithful remnant of believers. But they've existed. That's the point. Um, Throughout the world, true believers have existed who purpose to remain faithful to God despite their own social, political, and cultural context. Um, same is true today. Finally, number six, the final the uh, practical application here from this is religious and spiritual leaders of God's people have a great weight of responsibility, and they will answer to God for that. We're going to see that. Interestingly enough, God spends a great amount of time in this, as you notice, if you, as you who read it, rebuking the religious leaders of Israel, and then he's silent for four to 500 years. What happened in the meantime? Did the religious leaders repent in that meantime, in that four to 500 year intertestamental period? What happened? Those of you who kind of know maybe a little bit about the history, something happened. Someone came on the scene in the second century called the Pharisees. Hmm. Okay, so this is what's going on after Jesus rebukes the religious leaders, and then he's silent. And then 200 years before Christ comes, Pharisees, the sect of the Pharisees comes on the scene. And then guess what happens 100 years after that? The sect of the Sadducees comes on the scene. I mean, this is, this is amazing. I mean, you know, God's given his word. He's rebuked the religious leaders. And it's like, it only gets worse. He sets a high standard for those who proclaim his word. And of course, we can look at the Old Testament. God made it clear the prophets need to declare his message but he was especially angry with those who perverted his message. It's no different in the New Testament given to those who today who qualify and meet the qualifications of, of church leadership as well as instructions. God gives instructions for ministry. He gives qualifications. And there is it's, someone who fills those roles isn't a better person, a better Christian, more spiritual. It just means you have a different responsibility and you're going to be judged accordingly. Anyway, I wanted to spend more time with that, but we're way over, so... Next week, we'll get into the first chapter and begin to consider some of the things here that we need to consider. And uh, I trust it's been somewhat helpful to really get a big picture view of Malachi. Read it through again this week if you want to. I'm not, I'm not you know, asking you to do so this week for homework. You already did that. But if you keep reading it through, get familiar with it as we're going to take our time to go through it. Heavenly Father, thank you for our time together today, Lord. May our hearts be moved by the truth of your word. May we be convicted and ch may we change May we change as a result of what your word has to say to us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.